Welcome to Enough Room, a music learning project with Symphony Nova Scotia, supported by TD Bank Group. Gwe, Nin Deluisi Holly. Uh, I'm the music director at Symphony Nova Scotia, and welcome to another episode of Enough Room. And today I'm uh, interviewing a fellow conductor and a, a wonderful woman I've met through the Tucky Allsop Conducting Fellowship, Jerry Lynn Johnson. So the Tucky Allsop Conducting Fellowship is an annual prize organised by conductor Maren Allsop to support and promote women conductors. I was a runner-up in 2013, but Jerry won the main prize in 2005 and in so doing became the first African-American woman in history to win an international conducting prize. And the awards and accolades have been piling up ever since. She was a recipient of the 2009 Leeway Transformation Award, a 2010 honoree in arts and culture for the Power Shift and a 2010 British American Project Fellow. She was named a 2010 Philly 360 Creative Ambassador by the Greater Philadelphia Tourism and Marketing Corporation and a 2011 Woman of Distinction by the Philadelphia Business Journal. Jerry Lynn has been recognised for her accomplishments on 2020, the Tavis Smiley Show on NPR and on the NBC Today Show. And my guess is that's just a discreetly highlighted shortlist of the trophies acting as paperweights on her desk. So first of all, Jerry Lynn, thank you so much for joining me today. I know you're incredibly busy and it's a privilege to get to pick your brain for an hour or so. <laughs> well, the pleasure <laughs> is all mine, Holly. I, I've so enjoyed um getting to know you through this pandemic intimacy that we've all <laughs> developed through these Zoom communities and Zoom meetings, because um, we've never met in person. And so it's been really nice to get to know you. And thank you so much for inviting me to, um, to be with you on Enough Room. It's a pleasure for us, truly. And it, actually, I was, I was going to start with that. I mean, so the Tucky Allsop Fellows, we've been meeting I don't know, for, for at one point we were meeting every week, but now it's sort of once a month. And I mean, 24 or so busy international conductors in different time zones managing to get online and speak to each other at regular intervals for over a year. That's like the time-space continuum being warped completely out of shape. <laughs> have there been any other aspects of your work life in the last 18 months that have been altered by the experience of lockdown or, or the other major events we've come through in the same period, like Black Lives oh. Matter? Well, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I almost feel like the last year and a half has been sort of like a midlife crisis for humankind. I, you know, I feel yeah. like this has been a moment for for everyone, regardless of race or gender or socioeconomic. You know, I think everyone, you know, it was kind of like there was a pause button on, on the world in any number of ways, and, and it gave everyone um pause to think to consider to stop and ask some questions that you know when we're all so busy and just moving from one project to the next or one obligation to the next you know just going through our our daily monthly you know annual to-do lists as they are you know we don't always get a chance to just stop and and think yeah. um and the questions that we're stopping and thinking about are are, are really important questions, I think, on just an individual level. People are reevaluating the choices that they've made about their jobs and, and careers and, you know, what really makes them happy, what brings them joy, what's important to them. But also that we, as a, like what's important to us as, you know, different societies and what's important to us as human beings on, on the shared home of planet. Absolutely, absolutely. Now that things are starting to open up, and, and in parts of the U.S. actually, it, it opened up quite early on, has has work resumed for you, conducting work, or is it take, are orchestras taking a while to restart down there? Well, you know, I think, um, uh, yes, it's, you're right. Uh, you know, America um, is both divided politically, and, and I think um, that political divide actually affected the way work stoppages were handled in our industry. You know, I think mm. you can almost go through uh, the political landscape and see, you know, in America, the, the color that represents Republicans is red and, and Democrats is blue. Those are the two major political parties in America. 
and you can kind of look at the states that that went for you know one political candidate or another in our recent presidential election and the ones that were red had minimal work stoppages um yeah. <laughs> and so you know there were some orchestras that, that maybe they slowed down a little but they didn't maybe yeah. sometimes close all the way or they kind of were able to do some things that that orchestras um where uh, the, the pandemic was was considered more of an existential threat. I think, and people um, dealt with it in different ways. Uh, mm -hmm. And those places shut down completely. So it was really kind of geographically dis dispersed. Um, yeah. And so that being said, my work, depending on where it was geographically, was affected depending on how they were handling the pandemic. So generally speaking, like everyone else, um, just kind of an immediate pause button and let's shift. And things have opened back up for me in that regard. Um, but but also, I just personally pivoted a great deal towards um, consulting, which I had always done sort of in the background. And I didn't talk to a lot of people about it because, um, you know, people tend to pigeonhole you and they can't really think about the, the richness of a human being and being able to do more than one thing at a time. Like, you know, so I, since I could walk and chew gum, I had always done some consulting on the side. And so that came into the forefront during the pandemic. And so I switched all of the knowledge um, and experiential and um, knowledge that I had around audience development, diversity, equity, inclusion, and innovation in the arts that I had put into practice through my orchestra as a practitioner, I was able then to pivot and be able to monetize that knowledge and experience through my consulting. Great. That's wonderful. I'm going to ask you about this idea of innovation and, and diversity and inclusion really helping strategically with organizations in a minute. But first of all, I want to rewind a little bit because I find this Looking at your biography, what I find interesting always when I'm talking to a fellow musician is when I see a mix of university and college education and then the more kind of guru style assistant conductor sort of thing. So you went to the Wellesley College and University of Chicago. And I mean, Wellesley College has had some pretty amazing alumni, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, uh, you're in good company there. And you can tell us about that in a second. But then you went on full scholarship to the Aspen Music Festival as a conducting student. And you've been mentored by some of the greatest conductors on the planet, including um, Maren Alsop, who we have in common. But I'm just curious to know what your reflections are on classical music training from these very different experiences. So the university education, which is arguably about building critical inquiry and healthy scepticism, and the more traditional music training at Aspen or as an assistant, which is sort of guru-based or more like an apprenticeship where you learn from the master. Do you perceive a conflict between the two or did you when you were studying? No, I, I didn't. And, and it's such an interesting question. Thank you for asking. Because a lot of people have asked, you know, why didn't you just go to Curtis or Juilliard? And and excellent institutions, but um, for me, um, I felt it was important to gain a more well-rounded kind of academic background in music. And I say this because I think that's a choice every musician needs to make, for, every young musician needs to make for themselves about what is the best way to to access opportunity and, and knowledge. And for me, as an African American woman, I didn't think it was um, quite enough for me to simply go to a music conservatory and be successful. Mm -hmm. um, because we have many highly trained, excellent musicians uh, of color who went to these institutions, and you still don't see them at the yeah. highest echelons. And so that for me wasn't a determining factor in success. And so for me, it, it was all about ensuring that um, I, as a woman, I as an African American, and that kind of intersectionality of those two, that that when people saw me on the podium, that there was no chink in my armor. And by that, I yeah. mean, there was no place for anyone, either academically, historically, music theoretically, whatever context that you want to question my authority, no one had an in. Yeah, absolutely. there's there's no weakness. You're not going to get around me. I've studied the score. I've studied the history. I've studied the composer. I know the performance traditions. I, you know, I know all of that. So bring it. I will answer <laughs> your questions. But I mean, you know, for me, and this is, you know, we can talk about that later. But, you know, as a woman, my leadership style was one of intellectual honesty. Yeah, there are always going to be things I don't know. I mean, the collective history of any orchestra 
in terms of the number of people in the orchestra. The amount of times that they've done Beethoven 5 will always be greater than the amount of times I've done Beethoven 5 yeah. because, you know, and so there's just this kind of institutional knowledge that I always respect and admire and am willing to learn from. And so for me, I'm very comfortable saying, look, this is something I don't know. That's a great question. Let me find out. And I'm also always willing to to lean upon and and utilize the, the knowledge of the musicians in the orchestra. They're the experts on their instrument. I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. an oboist. I'm not a cellist. I know about these instruments and some technical things, but in terms of the lived experience and, and the intimate knowledge that they have, I'm, I'm always happy to rely on that and, and use it to, to the betterment of me as an artist and a conductor. And so, again, it isn't just about that I'm this impenetrable force on the podium and that I, you, you have no right to question me and, and how dare you mm -hmm. address these questions to me. It's more of ensuring people doubly, triply, quadruply, as the case may be, that I am qualified to do this job yeah. and I'm qualified to be standing up here leading you. It's so interesting um, because when I was sort of writing down questions I really wanted to ask you, one of them was you strike me as someone who is totally comfortable in a leadership position. That was the phrase that kept coming into my head. There's, there's something about the conversations we've had that often you'll quietly sit and listen to everyone else yabbering away and then it's like the voice of Gaia coming <laughs> through <laughs> from you and saying, hang on, I need to say something. And it, will, and it was, it, you just, you have this very steady, incredibly reasoned sort of way of leading a discussion. And that must be an incredibly wonderful thing as a musician to have on the podium in front of you. That's just like, oh, it's okay. Like mum's driving the car again. Do you know what I mean? It's like, this is, it's like no, this is someone who is assured and has thought very carefully before opening their mouth. And that really comes across. Were you always like that um, as a kid as well, as a teenager? Or is that something you've had to learn Part of it is, yes, I've always been that way. I've always been a deep listener. I, I tend to sit back because um, I, I find that I read people a lot better when I um, I listen to not only what they're saying, but I watch how they're saying it. And I also pay very close attention to what they're not saying, which I think is <laughs> always more instructive than what they what they are saying, like the things that they're leaving out or that yeah. they're carefully omitting or that they're just not aware of. Yes. <laughs> that, yeah. You know, I just, you know, and I think that I think we as musicians are a little bit trained to, to listen more deeply. It isn't just about the notes, but like the silence framing the music is equally as significant. Yeah. But um, so so that aspect of it, yes, I've always been kind of a watcher um, <laughs> on the side. And it, it's funny that you said, oh, mom's driving the car. I also think part of that is just being a mom, yeah. <laughs> like literally <laughs> being a mom. And, you know, having um, having a child and, you know, which never really happened very often. And I think the reason was because, you know, she I think she would see other little babies trying to have a tantrum about something. So she would just, oh, let me see if I can do this at home. And she would try this at home and I would simply watch her <laughs> and wait until it was over. And then she'd say, OK, are, are, are you done? Yes. OK, and then let's go on about, you know, like just let yeah. you have your little moment. Let you just try this and see it's not going to work. You're not going to get what you want because I'm the mom and I do know better. And while I'm happy to allow you to have these things. And, and so I, I think, and again, not that I think of orchestras as children, but I think um, just the respectful way that I would, I would raise my child it is just a matter of respecting who people are, where they are at that moment, allowing them to express. Because for me, I, I just, you know, people have so much to offer, but I, I think orchestral culture has been a place where that has always been just one direction, where it's only like the conductor, you know, mm -hmm. instructing the musicians or always being the smartest person in the room or being the most powerful person. And, and I think that has been a little deleterious to musician satisfaction in the orchestra, but also the audience's understanding of just the beauty of 80 to 100 people making music together on, on the stage. And, and so for me, I have to work very hard to try to, to be the conductor that I am on the podium in situations where I'm not on the podium. Yeah. Um, I mean, part of it is just natural, part of it is learned, and just, again, always trying to, to be a better person, whether I'm just 
on or off the podium. And I don't mean that in like some kind of high handed way. I just, I have a very <laughs> low opinion of myself and I'm just always trying to do the right thing. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> well, again, it's, it, I think it, it ties in with what you're saying about we, as a conductor or as a musician in general, you do kind of develop these spider-like sensitivities with antenna out everywhere, being aware of how, how what are people saying? How are they looking? How are they breathing? How is it sounding? How, how, many, how long do we have left? Do they look like they need a cup of tea? You know, there, there is this... <laughs> kind of big hive brain that stretches out from the podium. But actually also, you know, you're talking about the parental figure and, you know, you don't think of an orchestra as children. But the reality is many times orchestras can behave like children if, if there's kind of <laughs> there, there's words, truth Holly. to it. Yeah, no, it's true. And sometimes it's because there's an unhealthy um, sort of culture in the orchestra, but also sometimes it is because they're used to an autocrat on the podium who has treated them like children. So they've learned that yeah. kind of, so I think it's a really interesting insight. Anyway, we're talking about the meaning of life, but we've not actually talked about your <laughs> conducting yet. So, oh, okay. So I have this amazing list of, of people you've worked with, Philadelphia Orchestra, Colorado Symphony, Chamber Orchestra Philadelphia, Chicago Sinfonietta. I'm quite jealous of that one. I really like their stuff. Born with Symphony, Delaware Symphony, and Weimar Staatskapelle. And I'm sure it's a much longer list now because that's just on one of your biographies. It was probably written years ago. But I think, most interestingly, is the Black Pearl Chamber Orchestra, which you founded in 2008. And having set up, it being part of founding processes myself, I know what an enormous job it is and what a risk it can be. So can you tell me a little bit about that time in your life around 2008, the period leading up to that decision to take that risk, if it was a risk, and the path that Black Pearl has followed since? Because you have stayed with them, haven't you? Yes, um, I, I have. Um, so uh, I will say, I'll start with the risk element first. I think, um, well, I'll, I'll go back. So when I founded Black Pearl, you know, I had recently come off of the Taki situation. It was really wonderful. And um, I, I learned so much and got such great exposure in it. And it's such a wonderful, um, wonderful organization. And, and I worked really hard kind of during that year with Marin and, and even a little bit afterwards to, to continue to, to build it. And you know, kind of help create like collateral and like a logo mm. and, you know, the website mm. re redux and it, just a whole bunch of stuff because I felt it was really, really important that that the organization continue to grow and, and build broader support. And that that was just my way of being grateful for what it had done That's wonderful. for me. Um, th that being said, even with the wonderful platform that that gave me, it was still a struggle as an, an African-American uh, woman. And so... I had auditioned for, for three orchestras to be their music director and made it to the finals for all three and did not get selected. Again, not unusual. That's the way it goes. What was unusual and, and very generous, one orchestra um, had uh, the, the search committee chair had, um, you know, emailed the, the two conductors who were not selected to be their music director and offered feedback. Mm -hmm. to say, hey, thank you for your time, and we went with another candidate, but if you would like, you know, some, some feedback on your interview and audition or whatever, I'm happy to provide that. So, I, you know, this is just very rare for, for those of your, your listeners. Mm -hmm. You know, you just it's just kind of like you audition, you don't get a thanks, we went with someone else, goodbye, or you just never hear from them, and you just find out someone else <laughs> got the job. Like, oh, well, I guess that wasn't me. <laughs> you just kind of go <laughs> on to the next one, in the words of that great poet of our time, Jay-Z, on to the next one. So... <laughs> So I took this gentleman up on his offer. It was really, really nice. And we had a lovely conversation. And, and he said, look, uh, the, the orchestra really liked your conducting and the board uh, really enjoyed meeting you and thought you had great ideas and you'd be really great to work with. And he said, we just didn't know how to market you. And, you know, mm -hmm. and so the time frame for this was, um, so the Taki year straddled 2005 into 2006. And so this was 2007 when, when this happened. And I was like, oh, okay, I, um, I don't, I don't know. I guess you just market me on the rate. I mean, I don't understand. You know, you just market the way you market. I didn't understand, and so yeah. that's when he said, um, "You don't look like what mm. the audience expects the conductor to look like." 
And wow. so that's when I understood what he was really saying was that yeah. we didn't think we could sell you to our audience that an African American woman was our orchestra conductor. <laughs> and so I mean, at least he was honest, I suppose. You gotta hand it to him. He didn't make up some kind of but wow, what I wonder how I wonder what it felt what it felt like in the pit of his yeah, stomach it was, as he was saying that out loud. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, and I and I you know, I I've looked back on that so many times and I kind of feel like that email was really meant for me. Like mm -hmm. I know he sent it to both me and the other conductor who didn't get it, but I know mm -hmm. that was him hoping I would take him up on that so he could tell me the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, you know, in America it's a very you know, I don't this may be going out all over you know, America's just a very litigious country. It's unfortunate. But you know, so sometimes I tell that story and people are like, Did you sue them? I go, no, I, I didn't <laughs> that's not the immediate go-to for solving problems. Um, so no, I did not sue them because essentially what he told me was illegal. You're not allowed to discriminate yeah, yeah. on the basis of whatever, race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, you name it. You're just, it's yeah. not a thing that, that you can do. And so no, I did not sue them. I won't even say I was heartbroken. I, it, it was something cracked in me mm. <laughs> fundamentally with that because you know you work so hard and all conductors, you know, we work so hard to just scrape together any opportunity that we can mm. to get in front of a group of musicians to practice our craft. Um, and I had sacrificed so much and worked so hard and to know that no matter what was on my resume, it, it was not ever going to make a difference to anyone. Yeah. It was just yeah. hard. And so when you ask me about the risk of starting my own orchestra, there, in, in some ways there was no risk. I literally had nothing mm. to lose. Mm. And so I think in that freedom of, you know, when people talk about innovation and thinking outside the box, I think it's hard for people to think outside the box because you're in the box. So mm. when I found out that I was actually not in the box, oh, it was, you know, innovation became super simple then because I, yeah. you know, I could do whatever I wanted <laughs> and just, you know, make it work the way I just was able to just create, you know, the world as I thought it should be. And so Black Pearl is an orchestra, yes, but it really is a worldview. It is my worldview as an African-American about what if the orchestra were the world, what it should look like. It should look like everybody. It should look like everyone and, and people who are qualified and passionate and engaging and, and fun to work with and enjoy what they do and are just at a world-class level should be allowed to, to do that. And, and it's all kinds, of, all kinds of people. And we can always do better with diversity because, you know, that's, mm. it's not a fixed state. You know, it is something yeah. that changes over time. And so as, as a living system evolves and grows over time, as the members themselves grow and evolve over time, what diversity is also grows over time. And, and so for me, there really was no risk on one level because I had nothing left to lose in the industry. But on the other level, there was no risk because I was betting on me. Mm. So. And presumably you trusted you at that point. You knew you were, you were capable of it at that point. Well, you know, I have a lot of self-doubt about a lot of things. You know, am I really a good mom? You know, is this yeah. grapefruit really ripe? You know, a lot of things. <laughs> but, you know, the, I mean, it's just, you know, like, is this, is this the fastest way to get where I'm going? Should I trust my Google Maps? Like, you know, whatever. But, you know, the one thing that for me has always been infallible is my aesthetic sense. Like, I've always trusted myself as an artist. And so I was like, you know what, this is, we're just betting everything on me and my ideas, and that's it. I'm no longer asking permission. I'm no longer um, trying to politely knock on the door and say, hi, I have all these great qualifications. Can I have a turn now? I'm done. Yeah, yeah. That's so brilliant. And so that uh, clearly with Black Pearl, that, that applies to the personnel and the staffing and, and the people you hire and the people you work with. Did you apply that to the repertoire choice as well? Or was it a, a vehicle for you to also do kind of the canonic classical repertoire? Well, you know, that, and, and we, we get asked that question. I think it's an important one. So thank you for asking. We initially did not start with diverse repertoire for a number of reasons. One is we were already starting behind the eight ball, having more than one African-American person in the orchestra, in yeah. people's perceptions. I mean, yeah. you know, there is, and I say this with all of the diversity consulting that I've done, not just since the pandemic, but before that, there is this perception that there's an inverse relationship between diversity and artistic excellence. 
Yes. <laughs> and what that means yeah. is the more people of color you have in an orchestra, people perceive that the quality of the performance and uh, artistically goes down. And so, you know, uh, j just the fact that I as an African-American was leading the orchestra and then there was maybe, you know, one other person in it, people would be like, oh, they, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, that, that they would be problems for people. And so we needed yeah. to demonstrate the fact that we could do Mozart, we could do Beethoven, we could do Haydn, we could do Stravinsky, we could do Bach and Brahms. And not only was it not messed up and was it terrible, it was it was it was excellent and beautiful. And so what we did with that is that we we integrated um, composers that people had not heard of in a way that created just a much wider picture of the musical landscape. So um, a lot of times orchestras will do seasonal cultural programming. So in other words, you'll have, oh, Women's History Month, let's have a program of all women composers and a women conductor. Okay, that's nice. But by highlighting these marginalized groups in a marginalized month, you're just further re marginalizing them. So absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, so I just wasn't going to do that. Um, so what we did is like, um, we did a Black History Month concert. Uh, we, we opened with the Brahms Tragic Overture and closed with Dvorak 9, which doesn't sound terribly diverse, but we sandwiched it with a number of orchestrated songs by H.T. Burley. Henry Thacker Burley was born mm -hmm. in Erie, Pennsylvania, was African-American, what we would now call like an ethnomusicologist um, and composer at, who, who knew Brahms and worked with him at, at, at the American Conservatory when Brahms was, was there in New York. And so there is a connection of mentorship and, and artistic relationship between Henry Thacker Burley and Dvorak, and then of course Dvorak, who looked up to Brahms. And so there is this connection mm. between the three men that makes it authentic and interesting and appeals yeah. to people who are aficionados of classical music, but also people who are new to classical music and looking to see representation of themselves in that kind of historical timeline. And it is there. However, it's been hidden just the way that women composers have been there the whole time. You know, Latin ex composers have been there the whole time. So how do we bring those composers to the forefront so that there isn't this kind of hierarchy um, but that there is mm. this kind of broadening engagement of all these composers in, in the canonical timeline. I think about this a lot. Well, we've been talking about it a lot as an organisation where there's this great energy at the moment and activism, particularly after Black Lives Matter, but also the Me Too movement. And and I was talking to a 70-year-old female composer in the UK who was like, oh, yeah, this happens about every 15 years ago or so, and I get rediscovered again. As <laughs> yeah, She's like, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of used to it. There's a cycle. It just goes round and round. And so we've been talking about, well, how do you actually make it um, so, an activism that has deep roots and becomes normalized yeah which I find really interesting there was something you touched on then that reminded me um of uh, this is not dropping a, a clangy kind of self-reference here but I did a PhD believe it or not it's now basically a paperweight in my house but um <laughs> <laughs> it started with the idea that the conductor is both a site s-i-t-e and a site s-i-g-h-t for musical expression and 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 as conductors we all mediate that intense visibility and scrutiny in various ways learning micro awareness of our bodily gestures mannerisms facial expressions let alone all we have to do to learn the craft but there's a whole host of enculturated assumptions and readings to add in there for the sight in both senses of a woman on the podium and and I think most of us are aware of those but as I think you've mentioned in the past, to add to that being an African-American woman or a black woman on the podium is to kind of magnify that projection or, or complicate that projection for the people who are doing the, the gazing. Exactly. <laughs> Tenfold. I mean, yeah, that's, that's um, fascinating. It is. Uh, and I love the, the, the play on homophones. Uh, my daughter would love that too. We're working right now <laughs> on two, two, and two. Anyway, so the, <laughs> the point is. Um, but yes, I think orchestras are always these kind of multivalent happenings of there's different meanings. Um, and, I, and I tell black people about Black Pearl all the time, like when you come to a concert, of course, on one level, you, you're watching a, a, an orchestra perform, you know, Beethoven, Stravinsky, Florence Price, you know, what have you, whatever the repertoire is. It, it is a performance. You are watching an orchestra perform. 
But the site, S-I-G-H-T, of Black Pearl, what you're also is watching a performance of how race, gender, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, power, and agency are, are also performed in, in, in America. And so, mm -hmm. to your point, and I could not agree more, part of the performance takes place not on the stage, but in the audience's minds and yeah. their perceptions. Well, this brings me nicely to something I was desperate to ask you about. And I, I read a wonderful quote from you online, um, which I hope doesn't embarrass you, but I'm going to read it out. It and this was in, will, but <laughs> <laughs> It shouldn't. It, it made my heart sing. So this is in relation to arts institutions and systemic change and, and being agents of systemic change. And you said, that to me means we have to work to democratise creativity. We have to transform from being gatekeepers of an artistic product to being facilitators of the creative process for the citizens. And I just like fist pumped. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, baby. That's just, I've got it in bold in my notes because I just think that is the most tremendous thing to say about our role as artists. Can you talk a little bit about that? And well, is that something that came as a result of doing Black Pearl or? Is it something you've developed in other aspects of your work or was it always there, that sense of, no, hang on a minute, we're, we're not statues? <laughs> right. Well, I think, you know, I think part of it did come from from Black Pearl. And, and, and I have to say, you know, when I, and, and your comments are very, I, I really appreciate that. That means a lot. Um, you know, I think when I formulate these these statements, for me, it is just a way of, verbalizing and communicating the lessons that we've learned through Black Pearl over these like 11 mm -hmm. years now, almost 12 years of, of Black Pearl. Because, you know, that, that, that statement of, you know, you don't look like what our audience expects um, the conductor to look like, I essentially just turned that on its head in a lot of our programs. I just have decided to, to turn everyone into a conductor so that everybody looks like a conductor. Yeah. Um, and so in the process of watching what became kind of a, you know, I have a, a strong kind of streak of effuism, and that's not a real word. It's a <laughs> word that will become in the Urban Dictionary, but um, it, I spell it E-F-F-U-I-S-M, but really the acronym is F-U and then ism. But so I, you know, I just made a word <laughs> out of it. I love it. But I've just, right, I just have a strong streak of effuism. And so that, that statement I was an effuism, like I'm going to create a world of conductors so that everyone looks like a conductor. So in the process, you know, once that kind of Im impulse of effuism <laughs> dies down and I'm able to like intellectualize and, and kind of really look at this work, what we were really doing and, and, and is so much more important now than I think it even was back when Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were vying to be the Democratic candidates before Barack Obama won to be the president of the United States. Um, the, the ability to sh somehow give people a visceral sense of their own power, of mm -hmm. their own agency in society is critical. And I think, you know, people have always talked about sports and, oh, sports and kids learn. Yeah, that, I mean, I love, I'm a huge athlete. I, I love sports. My daughter loves sports. I, I'm a big fan of sports. But there is something about the arts and people's ability to engage in creativity and expression and the ability to check in with themselves to ask, what is it that I want? Who am I really? What am I trying to say? That I think is different than what people get from, from the agency mm. that they develop as, as an athlete in sports. And I think that is the kind of agency that is most critical now, and I, I, it's not even just in America, but around the world as this kind of democratic experiment on the world stage is, is coming into crisis. I think, you know, democracy itself mm -hmm. is, is being called into question and being tested in some pretty significant ways, um, regardless of whether you're in the United States or Poland uh, mm -hmm. or in uh, Brazil, uh, th this is, we're at a pretty critical moment. And so people's ability to understand that they have agency, 
that what they want matters and that they have the ability to interact with large institutional systems. Now, I'm not saying Black Pearl Chamber Orchestra is, you know, the healthcare system, but but it is making your wishes known and communicating in a way that gets an immediate response. And it teaches people that, that they can modify their communication to get the response that they're looking for. That they have that they can have a dialogue with an institution, whether it be an orchestra or a bank or a hospital, a doctor's office, um, the legal system, the educational system, you know, you, you name it. It gives them a way to create a dialogue with these systems for them to say, A, these systems do work. I can get what I need from them, from, from a democratic society. And also, I as an individual have rights that are important, and I have a way to, to assert those rights effectively in society. And even just to, a way to articulate them. Exactly. For me, that, that is the power of the arts, a way to acknowledge in yourself that you have preference or choice. That in itself, I think, is an incredibly empowered thing that though those of us from a, a walk of life who have never had to question that probably don't realise we're doing it and that we have that, the gift to do that. The, 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 um, the, the privilege of agency is something mm. that people take for granted. And, and I'm sure you, Holly, and, and, and other artists probably do a lot of work in social and community settings. So not just, we don't just perform in the concert hall, but we're out yeah. in the community doing concerts for people. And so oftentimes we as, as organizations will partner with, with non-arts organizations like community centers or even, you know, health centers, senior living centers, youth centers, things like that. And, and the thing that has always struck me in my interaction with these is is the constant concern with you know people you know in in social services or youth services or or health services or you know food insecurity those kinds of things who are putting out really high quality programs making sure that they're able to get to people who need their services and yet the people who need their services do not partake of them mm. it's free is really good people are not using them. I find that fascinating. Yeah. And so I think for me over time, it has become perhaps an idea that, that we as service providers are operating from a mindset of, of agency privilege, mm -hmm. that it doesn't make sense for us that you have all this access, but you're not walking up and stepping up and using it. And yeah. that is a privilege that we understand that we have the ability to do that. There are so many people for whom their own personal agency has been so undermined on a systemic level for so many years that even given the opportunity for these kinds of services and benefits that could really help them and impact their lives, that they, they don't step up and, and take it. And so um, the programs that we put together with whether it be orchestrating mm -hmm. leadership or we're in with, with youth and, and hopefully we can go back to, to serving um, uh, recently released um, uh, formerly incarcerated people um, mm -hmm. to to again help regenerate and help them refine their sense of of agency. That's amazing. It strikes me that a lot of this actually is only partially about what an orchestra is doing and how it's doing it, and more about the way people in general. Uh, link a sense of identity to the way they interact with the arts. That's not for me. I'm not the kind of person who does that. And which, which, funnily enough, is the inverse of you're not the kind of person I expect to be doing it. It's, it's the exact same thing, <laughs> right, but pe people right. impose it on themselves. But it, it strikes me the other flip side, if, if a thing can flip in two different directions, is a sort of an institutional thing that we've been talking about of there is this tremendous energy, not only from artists and administrators, but also from huge numbers of people from our audience, for instance, here in, in Nova Scotia, saying, genuinely, we are going to donate money specifically for you to democratise and make more open and restorative and equal the work you're doing. And, you know, we're finding people specifically want to donate for community and education work and for diversifying our repertoire. It's been this real sea change. But the thing that's difficult to change culturally is like you can Instagram and tweet that you love the idea and you support that that's what we're doing. But if you don't buy a ticket to come and listen to it, we won't be able to sustain it long term. 
So what would your advice be to these sort of really long-term diehard orchestral fans who just blimmin' love Beethoven 9? And <laughs> do you know what I mean? And they love the traditional concert experience. What's some advice you could give to those treasured and loved and passionate orchestra supporters about the thought of coming to a concert that is of or about or in some way for them represents a story that's not their own. So it might be that it's music by composers that they, the names they don't recognise or from a different culture. How can we help people with that? Sure. I think, um, so, you know, this is a question I get a, a lot from not just orchestras, but you, so this this issue of, of the repertoire or, or the mm. works that are being presented or exhibited, you know, depending on the art form, is across disciplines. So that this isn't just orchestras that, that struggle with this. And so just from a, a business standpoint, one of the things that I explain to people is you have to shift somehow people's loyalties with live orchestra performance from their their connection to the music to their connection to the organization. Because quite honestly, you can listen to Beethoven 9 whenever, however you want. Mm. You can have that as often as you want with a whole bunch of conductors. It's all been recorded about a billion times. So they're, they're, yeah. you're not going to miss out on Beethoven 9. Yeah. The experience of the, the spiritual connection of seeing 80 to 100 people in one place engaged in music making is a phenomenon that no recording can duplicate. It is also a phenomenon that is exciting and engaging no matter what piece is being played. And so that's why I'm saying I, I believe that the experience of that shared moment of being in in a place together where again the music is itself an instrument it is an instrument of making um making the spirit manifest in that place and time for those people that is a technology it's a spiritual technology it, it cannot be duplicated via in an online performance as, as much as we have all tried to during the pandemic um, it cannot be duplicated in a recording. And so if all you love is the sound of Beethoven 9, you can get that in a recording quite readily. But if what you love is the, the evanescent moment of music making of a group of people and the spiritual energy that that generates, um, you must go to that orchestra and be present and, and be part of that because it's only built when people come together. You know, there's that, the, the famous, and I'm terrible, so people who are fans of scripture and who are, you know, uh, uh, who know the Bible backward and forward, please forgive me. But, you know, there's that saying where, you know, where, where, where two or three are gathered in my name, there will I be. So, you know, mm -hmm. the, the orchestra, just by the collective music making, makes a musical church, <laughs> you yes. know, in that yeah. sense. And so if you want to go to church, you got to go to church. You can read the Bible at home, but if you want that togetherness, that moment of, of spiritual collective engagement, you have to go. And that Beethoven was once new and, and audiences at Beethoven's time didn't always like what he wrote. They would, you know, mm. they would get mad about certain things and, and that always happens. But from a practical standpoint, I would say, you know, orchestras, don't have to make the process of including unfamiliar works with the canonical repertoire a painful one for, for their patrons. Mm. They, can, they can make it a really gauging and exciting one, one that brings the audience along for the process of selecting those works, of learning about those works. If you have the opportunity to, to talk to living composers and, and selecting their works, engaging people in that process in some way so that there is some collective ownership about how those works are being selected. If you're commissioning new works, always exciting so and and that's what I mean about kind of being a facilitator of the creative process however that means for that orchestra and that community that is something that you can all create and decide together like there is no one formulaic answer that that mm. that is about the relationship between that orchestra and its community and I think that's rather than me being a prescriptive about here's do x y and z 
you know, like with my clients, what we always try to do is, is make sure that we're facilitating the process for them to have those conversations themselves. Mm. That's wonderful. That's all I had on my list of things to ask, Jerry. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we do a sign off? You know, I think, um, well, I mean, it's, it's always hard for me to talk about because, you know, Lydia and I talk about this all the time, of, you know, because she came up to me at like a League of American Orchestras thing like a few years ago. She's like, oh, my God, you're the only conductor, I, female conductor I know who's got a child. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and so then she had her kid. Um, and so, you know, we kind of laugh about just how exhausting it is and just making these arrangements and like, you know, childcare and like traveling with your kid and like, you know, all these kinds of things. Again, it's part of, you know, life on the podium, ex these mm. kind of expanding realities of what that means when you have, you know, different genders represented on the podium and all the other attendant things that people would think are distractions from the music making, but actually give you all these, you know, incredibly rich perspectives that allow you to just be a fuller human being inhabiting mm. the podium. Again, the word identity comes back. It just keeps Always. circling back, doesn't Always. it? And this idea of this isn't a cookie cutter idealized figure on the podium that we're all trying to emulate. It's put some weirdos on there and see what happens. You know, see what I mean, they bring into the room. First of all, I'm not a weirdo. And you're definitely a weirdo <laughs> though. But um <laughs> But that's one of the things I love about you, Holly. Wait, are we still recording? Okay, they didn't stop. <laughs> this can be the outtake at the end. Uh, yes, at the end. Jerry, thank you so much for talking with me today. It's been such a pleasure to chat, and I wish we were sitting in person and sharing a bottle of something nice while we had this conversation. That will have to happen some point in the future, but I know this will be just tremendous for our audience, our staff, our musicians, our whole circle of friends that we have in our awesome little online community with Symphony Nova Scotia. I think everyone's going to really a treasure having heard your insight and your perspective on all of this because you really are just um, tremendous to, to, to discuss interesting things with. So I'm so grateful to you for talking with me and all the best for whatever happens next as we come out of lockdown. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing everyone in person as well. And I just, again, appreciate the invitation to join you on the podcast. Thank you for your kind words and I look forward to speaking with you soon.